Okay, so I'm pause. Get going. Okay, we're ready to go. Right. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the SCORE Boston webinar on intellectual property for small businesses, practical concepts, and resources. I just found the other day, Eric, my, um, can not advance my slide? Use your, can you use your, um, click, with, click on your mouse on the screen and try that way. Um, there we go. Thank, yeah. thank you. Um, so SCORE Boston, most of you hopefully are familiar with us. We um, provide free and confidential mentoring at 20 locations, which of course now is not 20 locations, but more than that is we're all doing video, phone, and email from our homes. Um, we have over 70 volunteers with a wide range of experience and expertise. You can help in most any area of getting business started and, and now in helping get through this uh, pandemic. Uh, there's over 100 workshops also, which you can see on our website. And we can connect nationally to many volunteers to help in areas of, across the country. Uh, we are mentoring virtually and very busy these days with through video, phone, email, and we're happy to help in any of those areas. If you have a mentor, reach out for an update and talk about planning for during the pandemic and afterwards. If you don't have a mentor, mentor please go to boston.score.org and click on find a mentor and go through the process to, to get hooked up with one. And most of the workshops are now webinars also, and you can find that list also on boston.score.org. Today for the Zoom meeting, use the Q&A to ask a question, not the chat. We, um, we'll be monitoring the Q&A section for questions to the speaker. Uh, recording will be available, it will be emailed out to you um, tomorrow. And there'll be a short sur survey also, which we hope you would give us your feedback on. Again, use the Q&A button, not the chat for questions. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn it over to Bill Hulsey, who um, has many years of experience helping clients and in this area of, with intellectual property. And so now, Bill, it's for you. Great. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> good, excuse me. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to bring up my slide deck here, if you'll give me a moment. Um, let's see here. Thanks for your patience. Dick, are, are you out of the sh share screen now? Yes. Hmm. Uh, for some reason, I'm not getting to my document list here. You have to have it open already on your on your uh, desktop. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, then, just please bear with me for a second while I do that. Okay. So thanks again for your patience. This is obviously a new thing to me, but um, I hope you find this useful. Uh, my goal today, I've offered this in several uh, formats, never this one, but face to face and done the practical elements of it with a lot of small business people and creators of intellectual property is to cover the kind of four basic elements of intellectual property align it with some of the thinking that you probably already have about property. And then also give you some practical tips about what to do when you're commercializing your intellectual property, or you're acquiring the rights from other people to, to use their intellectual property. So it's practically oriented for you. And you'll see in the document uh, as we go through it, links to various resources, government resources, a lot of them, or good things I've read from law firms or otherwise that um, I think are useful if you have specific questions. But again, if you do have questions that you wanna raise, feel free to do that as we, as we move through it. 
So as the name suggests, intellectual property is just another form of property. It's like real estate. It's like the personal property you have. And like all forms of property, the US intellectual property system, which is patents, trademarks, service marks, copyrights, and trade secrets are designed to allow you, the owner or the holder of those rights or the creator of those rights to control who uses, uh, who uses them, who may not use them. And it's, it's driven by a commercial model that we wanna foster this sort of activity so that the, the creator or the inventor can, can take advantage of those rights. So again, looking broadly, intellectual property is anything that is created by the intellect as it sounds. So the broad category includes inventions, literary and artistic works, dance, designs, uh, symbols, names and images used in commerce. That would be your trademarks and your, and your service marks and things that maybe aren't, we're gonna talk about in the trade secret context, things that aren't uh, covered by or protectable by patent or copyright necessarily, but are still protectable as important things that a business may have in terms of a selling technique or something or a marketing program that they have that they consider uh, uh, proprietary. So again, the purpose of the overarching purpose of all the US intellectual property law is to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by creating a time frame, securing for a limited time to the authors and inventors, the exclusive right to those respective writings and discoveries. That's actually found in the constitution as you see there. And so it tells you how early uh, America as a government was thinking about how do we protect the rights of people? How do we foster the entrepreneurship that comes through creating intellectual property in a way that these things can be created and be put into the marketplace in a way that the person who works hard to create the idea or the invention can profit from it for a period of time. So the balance is we want to get the stuff out. That's the public uh, interest right but we want to get it out in a way that the person who creates it can commercialize it, but the public will ultimately benefit in the thinking that the marketplace will move it forward. So as I've, I've said, the legal protections uh, come from a lot of different sources and we're gonna march through them, not quite in this order, but we will. Uh, patents, we'll go through copyright, which maybe a lot of you are doing that. And, uh, trademarks and service marks, which are variations on the same thing. Uh, that's a, the next one is a misnomer. It's the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, not the Federal Trade Secrets Act. I, I, that's a typo there. And then we'll talk a little bit about some contract terms that you want to have when you're thinking about either letting people have access to your intellectual property or you're creating intellectual property for someone else in terms of a work for hire or when, when you're acquiring someone's intellectual property so that you can commercialize it. So if there are no questions, we'll start with patents. So a patent is uh, a form of protection for what are called inventions. So it's distinct from a copyright, it's distinct from a trademark. And the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, which you'll see some references to below, issues three basic types of patents, and really only two of those probably come up most. The utility patent is kind of the most common one when you see somebody coming up with a useful process, a means of manufacturing something, a new chemical compound might be, might be here, uh, Software kind of used to fall into this category, but software patents are, I think, kind of uh, not pursued very much anymore for a lot of reasons. Um, so what we look for is some novelty and that it has utility. That's why their usefulness, that's why the word utility comes in. I'll talk a little more about all of these and the, the process by which, and some of the costs by which uh, you'll, you'll pursue that patent if you go down that path. 
the design patent, I always like the one of the, the croc shoes or a messenger bag. It's, it's a new and or, uh, original and ornamental design. One thing that I'll tell you, a lot of times we run into people who are um, apparel designers or so on, typically uh, clothing, unless it's got, now that they have clothing with technological uh, aspects to it or functionality to it, some of those can be patented, but for the most part, you can't copyright or patent a, uh, an article of clothing. That's, I always say that's why people can, can replicate Dior's little black dress without violate any of Dior's um, copyright or patent. Of course, they can't put the trademark on there of Dior, but they can make the dress look pretty much the same. And then plant patents, we don't see a lot of. This is a very rare field where people are um, creating hybrid seeds and so on that are created uh, asexually. Uh, hybrid roses are an example that you, you'll see more commonly in some apple trees, the fruit trees and so on. So when you get a patent, uh, it's typically 20 years retroactive to the date of the non-provisional application. So you'll see in a minute, we'll talk about the process, but typically the first step is flying, applying for a provisional application. And then if you pass through the examiner's uh, tests, you get to the full patent application. And then a design patent is 14 years from the date the patent is granted. Uh, U.S. patent rights, although we do have treaties with a lot of countries, if you are in the patent field, your U.S. patent is only going to protect you within the United States territories and possessions. And if you need to pursue uh, patent protection in the European Union or even within the countries of the European Union or elsewhere, those are individual applications. Here's kind of the important point for you about patents is that you don't get the right to do anything. Actually, it's, it's a little uh, framed in the negative, but the, the, the rights granted to the patent holder are the rights to exclude others from making, using, or selling your invention or, quote, importing it if somebody had it outside the states into the states. So it's kind of a, a negative right, and I want to kind of emphasize that it's you don't get any uh, certification from the government saying you can commercialize this product or even in an odd way that other people may not have their own rights to the product as your invention as you put it out. That your right to make it, use it and sell it are subject to a lot of laws that may be related to the health and safety of the invention or some other uh, uh, aspect of the invention that's been regulated by state and federal law and by the rights of other patent holders. And it's, it's those of you that are exploring patents, I really want to encourage you to, when we talk about some of these other steps, to be thoughtful before you start putting a lot of money into patents. And, and here are a couple of them. Um, one is that a patentable idea, and we see this a lot, at SCORE isn't necessarily a viable business idea. Um, there are, last report I saw from the USPTO showed 400,000 patent applications filed annually. And some of those are for things where there's already very effective existing solutions or inventions. So somebody may actually get a patent on something that really has no commercial marketplace. And I'll tell you a story about one of those in, a, in just a second. But remember, when you make your patent application, <clears throat> pardon me, the patent itself may be very limited in scope. But another thing that happens is that patent applications are public. So those of you who are familiar with the term patent troll will know what I'm talking about. But there are law firms and patent prosecution firms who just scan the filings daily for certain keywords that their clients are protecting or have paid them to look for to protect potential conflict with their patents. 
And a lot of these patent trolls work for very expensive, uh, highly capitalized companies, and they will attack your patent application, both to the patent office and to you directly. And if you're a small inventor or you, you're not working for a big company, uh, you can get a very threatening cease and desist letter saying your, your application violates our patent and it can be five pages long of, you know, uh, just various patents uh, aspects that they feel are are being violated in your application. And if you, so I'm going to tell you in a minute a way to try to mitigate that expense or at least that threat. But in the context of, of practical considerations and the viability of your patent in the context of its uh, ability to be commercialized, getting a patent can easily cost. It's maybe even more now, depending on who you're working with and the nature of the thing you're trying to patent. But getting through to an approved patent, and again, that's not giving you anything more than the right to keep others from using whatever it is you've, you've patented, can be $15,000. So that's, that's a startup cost, if you will, if you think that you're going to, your business model is reliant on commercialization of that patent. And we'll talk down later in the, in the discussion about some ways that maybe you can uh, avoid that cost or align yourself with a potential user of your, your intellectual property and let their more uh, robust or effective patent office pursue those. But th the story I want to tell you, and there are sadly many of them, is some of you who um, are familiar with people who are on the Asperger's syndrome. There's some evidence that they, they are comforted by these very heavily weighted blankets. They're full of um, like glass or ceramic beads and you know, they'll weigh 40 pounds or so, but they, you know, the, typically kids like to lie down under them and it, it, it soothes them. So a woman came in who was very passionate about her, uh, what she considered an invention in this field. And it was hard for me to tell exactly what was unique about it, but I was familiar with, with the blanket and people were um, selling these for like $50 online. So she thought that she had something in her patentable idea that she was pursuing that was as much, enough of a differentiator that people would pay I think her price was $600 for her patent. It was, you know, her patented blanket. The sad thing is she had paid $20,000 in uh, legal fees to pursue the patent and hadn't received it yet because the, obviously the, uh, the examining agent for the patent office was saying, well, I'm not sure this is novel. You know, the marketplace is full of these. And so, she was, was, I think, into the firm for maybe eight or 9,000 in unpaid bills and was looking at another uh, 10 maybe to get this thing pursued to finality. And then the question was, well, what are you going to have? You're going to have this unique patented thing that you're charging, you know, maybe nine or 10 times what the market is charging for a similar blanket. And it, does that make a lot of sense? And do you really have the money to pay this attorney's uh, fees for that. So after we talked about it and she looked at some of her competitors in the marketplace, I th she realized that it wasn't an idea that made sense. And fortunately, we were able to call the law firm. It was somebody that I had worked with here in the Boston area in the past. Um, and they excused the rest of the, at least the outstanding balance of the fees. So she wasn't any further. But if, if you don't, you know, the, the point of the story is if you don't have a good idea for this, getting the patent, you may have something, but it's commercially worthless and you've, you've sunk yourself a lot of money there. So a couple more uh, practical points. The provisional patent is typically where you start. It's, it's a cheaper way to start. You can kind of get a, a year of uh, time to uh, hold your place in line as you make your disclosure. Um, 
they're not, they don't really do much and you don't obviously get the patent until you pursue it. It is a lot cheaper. So it has some, some uh, usefulness there. A lot of people, if there are any uh, academic scholars or scholars in the crowd that are listening today who publish, sometimes you'll file a provisional if you want to write articles on a subject so that you protect that right after you start to disclose it in the forms of your scholarly publications. So when we talk about what a patent is going to give you or not give you, if you are convinced that before you've filed anything, you have a viable uh, market for this that is meaningful and you can always consult with, with SCORE people in your, your area to make sure that it's kind of to test the, the fact that there is such a thing as a viable market for it and that there aren't you know, equally competitive products out there that you've either got a game changer or you've come up with a solution that is truly novel. You'll want to think about getting an attorney to issue a freedom to operate. So this is the freedom to operate is the kind of the flip side of what the patent offers. And it tells you an attorney will, will draft you one of these and either tell you that you do have freedom to operate. In other words, if the patent that you're applying for is, um, is granted, there'll be a space for you where other patent holders can't prevent you from either uh, through an, a patent infringement claim or from otherwise limiting your ability to try to commercialize what you've determined is a viable commercial uh, application for your invention. So it's a critical step. A lot of people skip over it, thinking that the patent itself is the, is the important piece and it's got its value, but it's, it's part of a three-legged stool, if you will, of getting your due diligence on the viability of the, of the product in whatever market you think it's gonna be in or whatever customer you think might wanna license it, getting this freedom to operate and understanding what's out there because that's a letter that the attorney will have to stand behind. So if, if they are wrong, then they will typically be able to step up to defend you as part of the fee that you pay them for the freedom to operate. And this concept is out of order, but the, the, basically what you disclose during your patent process, your application, and what the examiner looks for is what's known as prior art. And that means is there something out there in these hundreds of thousands and millions of applications or in non applied for patents or even in issued patents, is there something out there that makes it such that what you have has either already been addressed so that it's not novel, which again is one of the criteria, or if it's not, um, well, that would be the one if it's, if it's not somehow been been addressed or sought before. And again, the uh, publication of your invention, if you're a scholar or you're writing about your work, sometimes the provisional can be a, uh, a useful kind of first step, or at least to assess if you feel like you're in a rush to do something and you don't, and you can afford not to do the due diligence in commercializing your product. Like a lot of university tech transfer offices will get a disclosure they'll file a provisional almost automatically and then do the work of, of figuring out whether there's a market with their commercial partners for that. So there's some links here. Obviously the government patent office is just full of tremendous information about just about any th question you could have on both this and trademark, which we'll discuss in more detail. There's a nice little uh, link here to an uh, up council uh, article about the freedom to operate. The fees are listed in that special link that I gave you there. And then um, what we'll talk about in a little bit for this and other forms of commercializing intellectual property is, you know, to be thinking about a lot of times an inventor, an author, a creator of copyrightable content isn't necessarily the best person to be trying to commercialize that. There are existing 
uh, supply chains, if you will. There are existing companies that are selling the product that you may have improved with your patent or that are publishing in the area that you have written some stuff in. So you always want to be thinking, and again, we'll talk about that more, about are you the best even though you're the best person to invent or create the intellectual property, are you the best person to be in the distribution end and the marketing end and so on? Because sometimes it's better to align with another company or somebody who has a distribution chain. And when you do that, that's when you wanna be talking about some of the um, contractual documents that, that we'll discuss later. So are there any questions there before I move on? No questions on that topic, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so trade secret is the, it, it's protected under the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, as I said, not the Federal Trade Secrets Act, but a trade secret is a way for you to have a conversation and protect intellectual property that maybe you have uh, mixed together some information. For example, I had a client who was a, a very large uh, big data software company and their whole uh, underlying software was open source that they had stitched together in a, in a certain way to provide a very reliable and robust platform for people who were had big data needs in a lot of different industries. They offered an open source version but what they basically, where you couldn't, you couldn't um, break it down and try to see what the code was, but people could get it for free. But what they were selling was the service package that they sold on top of this effectively open source software. And they protected their rights in that, uh, their proprietary way of stitching this together and connecting themselves to the data systems of the client through trade secrets, not through patent and not through copyright. So one benefit here, for, so again, if you're in these fields, and we'll talk about this more in the context of confidentiality uh, when you're entering into a commercial negotiation with somebody, but the benefit is you can keep these secret, unlike a patent, which obviously is, must be disclosed to the public or a copyrighted work, which obviously must be published in order to be to be copyrighted. So it allows you to protect those trade secrets. So this may be where the bulk of, of the people on the, on the webinar today are interested. Uh, my, my experience is that more people are creating stuff either that's copyrightable as opposed to patentable or have questions about trademark and, and service marks. So we will dive in. So copyright is this is the language from the statute provided to the authors of original works of authorship with the emphasis being on original, whether they're published or unpublished. And they sweep in a range of things, music, artistic expression, a painting, uh, the designs. If you have a design for a dress or a piece of apparel, you can copyright the design. You can't copyright the iteration of it in a piece of actual apparel. But it's, it's a very broad uh, set of rights for things that you wouldn't patent. But we typically think of when people are writing things, creating websites, uh, marketing materials, and so on. But again, the key for that is that they be original and that they be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So the, when people come in, a lot of times we will have a couple people who come in and they've been working on a company together or brainstorming a, a business venture and they wanna protect their, their brainstorming. So you can protect what you write down, but the brainstorming, unless you have a trade secret or a confidentiality agreement, just what you say to each other is not protectable under the copyright because it's not fixed in that tangible medium of expression. And again, we'll talk about that a little more. <coughs> Pardon me. So again, it, it's protecting that, that 
fixed form, the written form, the, the photograph, the, the musical notation, the sound recording, the moving picture, the DVD, whatever, uh, the streamed version, and so on. But it does not protect, if I wanted to write a story about two star-crossed lovers who end up mis thinking one is dead when the other isn't, I, I can't protect that idea. I can protect West Side Story. And if I were Shakespeare, I could protect Romeo and Juliet if that were still within the time frame. It's not, but, but I can't protect that general idea. So we'll talk about this next, which is copyrights are yours when you create the work. And you can put the C on there. You can put the copyright notice that the Copyright Office suggests as soon as you create it, where you would put the copyright notice and the date. And I like to suggest people put the phrase all rights reserved. So again, it, because you should put people on notice when you have a website, when you publish a blog or whatever, that this is your content and it's not to be used without permission. Again, it's when it's fixed in that tangible form the, again, perceptible either directly or with the aid of a machine or device. So however it's put down so that we can know that what you created, we can somehow refer back to that work or that iteration. That's when the work becomes protected. And you can see again, the list of, of protectable um, items. This is not the whole list by any stretch, but you'll see a link to the Copyright Office, which is in the Library of Congress. So an individual copyright, this is important if you're creating a work, but it's also important if you're uh, leasing the, licensing the work to another party, or if you are receiving rights from a third party, um, but the creator or somebody else, that the individual is the life of the author plus 70, a corporate is 120 years or 95 years after publication. And the reason this law changed recently was about two years, three years ago, maybe a little longer, all of the original Disney uh, stuff, all the Mickey Mouses from Steamboat Willie and the archival stuff was all due to expire under the then existent copyright laws. So uh, the Congress stepped in and gave uh, companies like Disney and others an extension for a period of time. That being said, all these things being equal, if you come across a work that was created before 1923. It's in the public domain, which means that you can use that work without permission of the copyright holder. So one of the big questions that always comes up is, well, what, what are the benefits of, of actually going to the US copyright and copywriting my work? It's not particularly expensive to do, and there's no, scrutiny uh, process that the Copyright Office goes through to see whether you've actually incorporated work from others and that everything you're claiming to own of, is as your copyrighted work actually is. All they do is they process it and say, this claim for a new copyrighted work is now been approved and they register it accordingly. The benefit of it is if you are commercially, you're in the marketplace with your with your stuff, then you may want to um, engage in the fee. It's a business expense. It's deductible of uh, going through the registration because then you can put the the R there for copyright as a registered work, and there is a a definitive statement now in the Copyright Office that you're claiming ownership to this work as of that specific date. So that's, that's one benefit. They used to talk about the, the poor man's copyright where you would mail yourself a copy of the thing and have the date stamp of the, of the, of the written work or whatever and keep it in the sealed envelope that you mailed it to yourself. That's not valid. It doesn't have any, any use at all. Um, if you are somebody who is working and publishing overseas uh, or in foreign countries or in translations, 
we do have copyright conventions with most countries in the world. So there's usually a good way um, to rely on your US copyright, particularly if you get it registered with the Copyright Office to have that protectable. And that's, that's important to remember for two of the following reasons. One is one of the rights that the copyright owner has is the right to create translations in the work. Uh, and the other <clears throat> big one is to create what's called, I'll just go back for a second, to create what's called derivative works, which are works that are based on the original. So for example, if I wrote a novel, the rights to create a movie version of that novel belong to me as the copyright holder. Are those questions for me or for just you guys? Well, Bill, there's a question about copyright. Should I insert copyrights when I post illustrations from my children's book on Instagram? Well, that's a great question. I would. You could actually build it right in as a watermark, pardon me, <clears throat> right in when you post it. Uh, there's a way to, when you post a photograph or your screenshot of the thing, you could definitely put that in as a watermark on the bottom, or you could, I think, put something on your Instagram account that's saying, unless otherwise noted, all images that appear on this uh, Instagram account are copyrighted by, and then indicate who, who owns the copyright. All okay, right. another question is, are there copyright trolls? <laughs> yeah. There are, unfortunately. I guess anything that has a commercial value has a, has a troll attached to it. What you will, you know, if you think about it, I, I think about an industry like these um, kind of romance novels that, that j people just crank out, you know, and it's almost inevitable that those are going to replicate the format you know, the, the story arc and so on of those stories. But what, what you have to watch for and what you often hear in terms of plagiarism or is inadvertently picking up more than, and we're gonna talk about fair use next. More, you know, if, if for example, you're writing a novel and a whole paragraph or a whole chapter comes from some other work or appears to be close enough to it to look like it's a legitimate derivative work, that's when you're gonna get it. And a lot of the bigger publishers have scanning mechanisms to just as they do with uh, photographic images where they just scan the internet for, you know, look for these words that we think are unique to the way our client describes something. Or I had a client who had gotten a hold of a picture of just a, a, a blackberry bush and he had posted it on his website for um, the health benefits of various fruits and vegetables, including blackberries. And the, a, a, a copyright tool company in New York found that the image belonged to a guy, a commercial photographer in Great Britain. And they wanted $500 for the use of it, even though you could have gotten the, the right to the photograph for like $25 if you had gone online. So, but again, they're out there to answer your question, Richard. Anything else? Yeah, now we're getting a few coming in. Um, it's so, always a copyright. Yeah, confirmation. You can put a, co a copyright watermark without also registering with US, but it will not also have the R indicating registered. Is that correct? Correct. You use the C. And if you, again, go to the, to the website, they'll show you what to do, the best ways for various medium to put your um, copyright notice out there for the world when you publish. Okay. And can you copyright a live event concept like a festival or a conference? You can copyright the film of it. You can't, the, the live event is not fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Okay. So you, you could copyright or maybe trademark the title, right? But you can't copyright the idea that there's gonna be a festival for you know, ice cream eaters, which I would attend, that's for sure. <laughs> Our, our social media posts copyrighted. Our social media posts, posts copyrighted? They can be, sure, like blogs and things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the social media platform you're on may not permit that. 
So you need to know in terms of your terms of use, whether the things that you put on there are proprietary. But a lot of people, influencers, uh, you know, are careful with their blogs and what they say, and they want that information. Sometimes they want it reposted. And if you have, when you have your terms of use, either for your own social media, or if you're a blogger and you have your own uh, sites for those, you can put on there the limitations, if any, of uh, what other users may do with your the content that you put there. Great. Okay. You can proceed. Thank you, Bill. Okay. So um, again, copyright is is we do have very robust uh, international copyright laws. So usually pretty good shape. Again, the, the issue with all of these, I'll tell you, is not your technical right. It's kind of the reverse side of the troll. It's not your technical right to enforce your copyright. It's your financial capacity and who you're going up against to try to enforce it. So, uh, you know, a lot of times an artist may inadvertently step on another artist's copyright or something. And typically a cease and desist letter, politely put, or a request to have a permission to use the, the work will do it. But to your earlier question, Richard, in the context of big corporations and so on, typically they come down pretty hard and pretty quickly. So, so fair use is a nebulous concept. It's not been particularly well defined. The, the Copyright Office tries to consider it and uh, they, they give you basically these, these four elements that we'll talk about. There's a lot of struggle in the uh, context of linking. You know, if I, uh, in scholarly works, obviously we, when we take some information from another person's copyrighted work, we're careful to, to cite that in our scholarly citations. And that's always a nice, a nice place to start. But the, the general rule about fair use is the kind of the public interest side in the, the reasons behind the copyright laws, which is we want information disseminate, disseminated. So if you are a, a scholar or a journalist and you come across something and you say, well, so-and-so wrote, you know, and then you take a piece of that and you can read more of their work and then you take a link to wherever that work is found. That's typically going to be fine as long as you aren't passing the work off as your own, A, so you're attributing it to the actual owner or copyright holder. And oftentimes, I will say parenthetically, those aren't the same people. A lot of people who publish, if those of you out there who do publish will know, oftentimes you're listed as the author, but no longer the copyright holder and your publishing company or your music company will be listed as the, as the copyright holder um, anymore. But the, the four criteria are the purpose and character of your use. So for example, if you're trying to sell Coca-Cola by copying stuff, that's a very uh, highly commercialized use. On the, on the far end, if you're using it for scholarly purposes, if you're an educator and you come across with a something uh, from a periodical or so on that you want to reproduce for educational purposes, that's on the less commercial end. The second one is the nature of the copyrighted work. If, if you think about um, Andy Warhol's images of, of Marilyn Monroe, those are his proprietary artworks. You don't really get to copy one of those and put it into your work because that that image of the work is effectively uh, part of what he owns and that it's uniquely commercialized in that context. The amount and substantiality, again, if you take a chapter from somebody's work or if you take, uh, well, in the context of sampling, music sampling, back particularly when that first came out, there was a Roy Orbison song called Pretty Woman and then that was uh, sampled into a, a more current hit and it led to a huge litigation that I think ultimately was resolved that that was a permissible sample 
of the work because it was brief in duration and didn't basically undercut Roy Orbison's market for his song um, because it was music for a different audience and so on. And that's the last point, the effect of the use upon the potential market. So if the, the song in this case was not particularly competitive with the kind of people that listen to Roy Orbison, it was for a younger generation. I think it was a rap song or a hip hop kind of song. So not really two audiences that are, that are competing with each other. So we'll move on here. Um, and this is important, these, these two concepts in part, because a lot of people get it wrong. And those of you who uh, are, as I mentioned earlier, when you, two people are working together on something and they start to put that information in writing, whether they're creating a website or they're blogging together, they're creating a technical manual or whatever, they're engaged in what's known as joint ownership. And typically, it can be more than two, but typically joint ownership needs to be addressed and the rights of the authors need to be addressed in what's called a joint authorship agreement. And we can make copies of those available to you if you need one. But it's where you address the rights of the parties to commercialize the work should they move in different directions because each joint author owns the work in its entirety unless this joint agreement has uh, specified otherwise that only one person will have the right to commercialize and so on. So the, um, the key is this, you see this not so much when people are working together well, but sometimes business partners don't end up on the same page about the, the outlet for the work or what, whatever. And if you, when they break apart, people that are joint authors are often disappointed to learn that both parties can take that work that they created and take it in their own direction. So get that joint authors agreement. And the other one, which is um, very common and very certainly common in today's gig economy and so on, is what's known as work for hire. So typically, as I said, when someone is creating a work, they're considered the author and they're the initial copyright owner. The exception to that is the work for hire doctrine where people who are paid by someone else, another individual or a company to create content that's copyrightable. That work is called work for hire and it's owned by the person who hires the author to do the work. Even though it's creative and original, a lot of artists, a lot of marketing people, a lot of people in various, you know, videographers and so on do some great work. And sometimes they're surprised to know that they've done that work and in, a in exchange for their fee or their agreement, they've transferred the ownership without any additional work to be done. That ownership is transferred to the employer or the person who hired you. So how do you protect against that? Well, a couple of things you wanna think about is certainly creating what's called portfolio rights. If you're going to create work for hire, if you're a photographer or a videographer or a musician or what have you, you should at least retain the rights to make this work available so that you can show other potential customers the quality of your work. So it would be a non-commercial right that you would have. You can't sell it somewhere else. The alternative is if you have a work and let's say I think of this because there's a jingle that I hear on NPR, but I also used to hear it on um, in the movies as part of the when they were playing the trailer. So somebody had created this jingle and they sold one set of rights to NPR and they sold another set of rights to the, the movie corporation that they licensed it to. And the reason, and you can do that with anything. The reason I started our discussion with it, reminding you that it's just a form of property is that you can often think of copyrighted work or patented work as like 
real estate and you can own a building and you can sell the building, but you can also lease all or part of the building to someone else. You can rent part of it. So when you're thinking about rights that you were maybe giving to a given uh, purchaser or licensee or acquirer of your intellectual property, you want to be thinking about what are the uses that they want the work for? Are they limited in geographic scope? They only want rights to use it in North America. They only want rights to use the design or whatever in the context of their particular product or marketing campaign or what have you. And can you have the option of retaining those remaining rights in case there's a market for them somewhere else? And that's particularly important if, again, if you're a designer, I find um, sometimes fabric designers and, and people who do artistic designs for things, those designs have a lot of different applications. So if somebody wants to license your design to make wallpaper, for example, then that's all the right they need. And you can keep that design and use it maybe in another, in another format. The other piece that you want to think about when you're in working for someone else, whether it's work for hire or otherwise, is the extent to which you're going to provide them with something that's not new for this engagement or this assignment, but is what's called pre-existing work. So if you have a portfolio, again, I'll use the design uh, example of, of designs that you've used, if you're going to incorporate those into a product for an employer, you need to tell them, I'm giving you not ownership of that design under work for hire, I'm going to license to you that piece of it. So anything that I create new and exclusive for you that is not, remember, a derivative work of something that I've already created, but is wholly new, so it would be independently copyrightable. If I do that, you get the new stuff under work for hire, but you only get a license to the other stuff. And that license wants to be narrowly tailored to the use for which the, the hiring company or the hiring individual plans to use it. Any questions on that? So we have, we're getting several questions in this whole area of copyrights and, 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 okay. and so forth. So maybe we ought to get through a few of these. Sure. Um, you want me to read them to you or do you want to look them up? I, It'll be safe. If I go away from this, I'll probably fall off okay. the internet. So. <laughs> Got you. So if you, from a, one of the attendees, if you find someone has used your text and you have indicated it is copyrighted, what are the costs associated with dealing with that theft? So if you find someone has infringed on your copyright, the first thing you should do is assuming that you, it's an individual or even a company is to write to them and say that you're using my copyrighted work, the language that I see here or the image that, I, that you have here is something that I created and copyrighted. And that's why you want to put the, the copyright uh, date on there as well. So as soon as you start publishing these, you, you wanna fix that date and time. And you know, a lot of people will stop maybe some won't but a lot won't if you if you don't get them to stop your options if you have it registered are not great you can sue them but there's the if you've got your copyright registered you're entitled to certain statutory damages and attorney's fees for an infringement if you have not registered it, and this may be the one benefit if you think you're at risk of having serious infringement issues, you're not going to get attorney's fees mandatorily and you're not going to get statutory damages. So you're going to have to prove the economic loss that you've suffered by the infringement. And that can be factually dense, which means time dense, which means a lot of attorney time. So it can be expensive. But again, I find a lot of, you know, who knows, I don't, it's anecdotal, but, you know, if an individual infringes, typically it was uh, inadvertent. And if you tell them, they'll typically stop. 
Okay, another question here from Alan. He wanted to know about the, if the length of a written work matters. He created t-shirts that had a particular phrase on it and he found somebody selling a duplicate shirts with the same phrase and they had an argument about whether the phrase was copyrightable. Does the length of the wording make any difference? Not in itself. The question is, um, you know, is it, is it something that's original? So if the phrase was, you know, I am what I am, like old Popeye, then somebody else owns that copyright to the extent there was one. You always want to think about trademarks with things like logos on t-shirts and stuff if, if they're representing the, the, the good. But can the, can the person give an example of what was on the t-shirt? Um, that was the short phrase. I, um... well, if they can type it in, we could, it might be useful to address it because sometimes they're just not copyrightable. You know, the, the phrase, uh, the sun shines on everyone, it probably isn't copyrightable. This was, if I'd known it would be so much work, I would, never would have gotten cancer. <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't laugh at that. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, if you, you can always assert the copyright and you could have registered it. I think if you, I, I, I just would worry that it's one of those things because the first part of that uh, is not original. If I'd known it would be so much work, I would never had children or X, Y, or Z. So it's the last part that's the unique piece of it. And does the combination with what's kind of public domain with that create something copyrightable? And it might, it might. But if, if it's the if it's the trademark for kind of a line of things where, you know, it's the branding phrase, if you will, then you might have a better argument in the trademark arena for that. Okay. A um, couple questions about referencing another's work and, and providing a link, you need to get permission. You, this it's, I, I wish there was a definitive answer. A, a simple link that says, if you want to know more about X, like you'll see in my thing, there's links to other sources, some uh, commercial and some US government, which don't have copyrights. I think that that's acceptable. I haven't seen any law that says a link is wrong. If you link to the underlying content, like let's say you're, uh, if you take them to the page where they can find the article, that's one thing. Obviously, if you start lifting some of that content into your page and you're outside of the scholarly uh, field or meet, meet another fair use uh, exception, then you're probably infringing. But a simple link, I think, is generally fine. Okay. Um, let's get one more in here. Um, if, if you create a work and then do work for someone else, and utilize some of the material from the original work, you own the copyright and then the new people only own the new version? Thank you, yes. So that's what I was trying to describe earlier in terms of pre-existing works. So if you create a work and then let's say there's two paths. One is you have among the rights that you have when you own that work that you created is the right to create a derivative. So you're not violating anyone's copyright if you create a derivative or a variation on that work. You change mediums or you update the text or the story or something. Um, the question is, is that new work, the new piece of it, the new medium potentially falling under the work for hire doctrine? So the burden is on you to carve out, to say, look, I'm going to give you something that's unique to you that you can use in whatever context you're, you're hiring me for and that we're agreeing to use it. But I'm reserving the right to use the underlying piece, the originally created piece, for all other purposes, unless you want to talk about buying or licensing those rights independently. Because if you, if you aren't careful about that, your work for hire agreement, if it's not really precisely written, will appear to convey those rights to the owner. 
So does that answer that? Great, great. Um, why don't you proceed and we'll come back okay. to questions later. Yeah, okay. Okay, so that's pretty much until we get maybe down to the end. But th these are some really good copyright resources. The US Copyright Office, as I said, is in the Library of Congress and they work very hard to make materials available for people who are not lawyers to understand what your rights are. And, you know, we don't have time to dig into all the different ways you, you would want to record a copyright, let's say on a sound recording or the difference between the sound recording copyright and the sheet music copyright. But these materials are here you, and you'll have my information as well as everybody throughout SCORE. So if, if you run into specific questions, you can always reach out to, to ask about those specifically. But again, these materials I think are just, are just superb. All right, so for those of you who are in business or thinking about being in business, a lot of times uh, the question comes up of, can I trademark my name? Can I service mark if, if my product is a service, if I'm a plumber, if, I, if it's a good, then it's a trademark. If it's a service, it's a service mark, but they're treated, uh, treated effectively the same way and typically grouped under the, under the title of, of, uh, of service, or trademark, excuse me. So trademark is kind of easy at one level. The problem you often find is that there is somebody else using your trademark for unless you really come up with a strange name typically <clears throat> when a trade a person comes in with a trademark question you can you know google is great for this and you can find um trademark you can find that name use in trade or service somewhere a lot of the time things that you and i'll go back to that in a second but things that you can't trademark are things like your name you know or the name of a famous person or something like that but there the trademark database and you'll see the the link to it here is easy to navigate but kind of difficult to understand and the the reason for that is that trademarks are issued in classifications so if i get the trademark for the name international business machines or IBM, I only have that trademark in categories related to computers and related software and so on. It, it, that one may be too big at this point, but if I wanted to create a line of apparel called IBM, I might be able to trademark that because it's an entirely distinct industry. And, and the fundamental question that the trademark examiner asks is that, is the consumer likely to be confused by the use of the name or the initials IBM, for example, in the context of a line of, of clothing, as opposed to like if they came to the clothing site and said, oh, I wanted to buy a mainframe computer. How did I end up here? So they look to that likelihood of, of confusion. And a, a lot of times you'll get when you start to do your initial search on what's called test, which is the trademark electronic database, depending on the name, you'll see a lot of uses and you kind of have to, if you're doing it on your own, pour through them one by one to see what category is this in? Uh, is it something that looks like it conflicts? Is it a live trademark or has it been abandoned and then it's dead and therefore it's available to be in play? This is an area I it, obviously you can copyright anything uh, pretty simply. You don't need a lawyer's help. But this is an area where I think some of the online legal uh, providers like NOLO or Rocket Lawyer or LegalZoom actually do a pretty efficient job getting you through the first step if you think it's worth it after you've done your work to determine whether you want to have a federally registered trademark or service mark. Now, I'll tell you that just like with copyright, assuming no one else owns the trademark, you own the trademark as soon as you use it affixed to the, to the good or service that you're delivering. You're using that in commerce. 
So if you start it and it's trademarkable, you don't need to register that trademark. And you would, you would use the TM or the SM designation to indicate that you're claiming this as your trademark or service mark. What you would get if you received a registered trademark is the right to put the R there. And what that would do would then definitively stake out your position that's been now approved and vetted by the federal trademark examiner that you own that trademark or service mark. And just like there are patent trolls and just like there are copyright trolls, there are trademark trolls. And these applications are at times aggressively um, you know, pursued and defended. I'll give you a little, little war story here. We had a client who here in Boston who uh, sells chef's aprons. So she had put her little logo up. It kind of looked like the Levi's tag on Levi's pants, but it was up on the left uh, kind of apron breast side on the top of the of the uh, apron, a little red thing. And she got a five page letter from a company that had like a hundred lawyers on the letterhead claiming that her placement there was infringing the trademark of a company that made aprons in California. So she only sold to the trade in, in Massachusetts, This, but they had registered their trademark. And she said, I don't, I don't have the assets to fight this. I'm just going to have to redesign it, even though I think they were clearly wrong, but they know that they can, you know, bully people out of the market. So there's always that downside to, um, to putting yourself out publicly and registering. And an, another option I'll propose to you if you're uh, not national or regional in scope is to look into the Massachusetts trademark where the process is similar, but the, it's a little less rigorous and you can uh, get a trademark that is basically certified within the state. If, if you think your business is gonna, gonna remain within the state of Massachusetts. So now we'll move into some, some practical limitation or implications, some of which I've tried to, uh, you know, allude to earlier, but I think they're worth uh, addressing again, because really even the best idea, there's a million great ideas out there and a lot of them just fail, not because it was even a good idea or it might've had an impact or had a, you know, was a new solution that was better and maybe cheaper or whatever. But the people the, who invented or created the intellectual property didn't really know how to do it. So I'll, I'll start with the idea again that intellectual property is just property and it has commercial value to it. it ha we don't have a society like in France where we, the author or creator has what are called paternity rights that can never be waived, but everything in your creation, your invention, your piece of copyrighted work, even your trademark is an asset. And it can be sold, it can be licensed, it can be divvied up. You wanna think about if somebody is gonna use your work, how are they gonna use it, what market, where do they wanna use it, and do I need to give them rights that go beyond that, or do I wanna target my my license uh, will put aside sale for a minute to uh, that limited use of a prospective person so that I can deploy that intellectual property perhaps to another customer in another market or another region or what have you. So it's, it's like the building where you can sell, lease, rent, uh, and so on. The, when you're thinking of yourself as the creator of the content, there's a long, long way from if it's a patent, becoming a manufacturer of the patented invention, getting a sales team and doing all that stuff. So with almost all intellectual property, people kind of envision themselves being the creator 
uh, creating it, if it's a book, uh, being the publisher, getting the sales and marketing team. So a fundamental question is, is, is it better for me to align myself with somebody who already is in my market, who would find my product unique, useful, something that they could sell and use their existing resources, their sales team, their accounting team, their you know, delivery team to get that, that idea, not that idea, that creation from the point it's in to the customer and collect and pay you. And that's, those are variations on the form of licensing, which is a situation where you limit, you may limit along the terms that we discussed geographically, uh, a term of years for a license, uh, license to a particular market. And you typically, the options to be paid there this is the compensation structure now, are a function of kind of risk reward sharing. If you want to say, well, I don't, once I give it to you, it's up to you to sell it, and I just want a flat fee, you're taking less risk that the product will fail and won't generate any income, but you're foregoing the reward that it sells a lot. So for example, I negotiated a couple of big um, K through six math curricula to one of the major publishing houses. And they had projections of what they were gonna sell for. So we said, well, look, we'll, let's do a hybrid where you'll pay us X amount uh, upfront. And then we'll do a royalty system based on that, based on sales. And the more royalties you have, we, would, we step the sales royalty up so that we would recoup a higher percentage on the thinking that their, their costs would be recouped once their initial investment was recouped and then they would be making more profit on the sales too. So it's a, there's a continuum of compensation there from a fee, which could also be for work for hire, to a more license fee or royalty agreement on the far end. And both of those can also be done in the context of whether you're licensing or whether you're selling the product to the individual. You can be paid your upfront fee and have less risk of failure, or you can try to ride the train with the, with the purchaser or the licensee and take a higher reward depending on their, their sales. Uh, so I think I've covered a lot of, of that. Um, we're gonna talk about some specific terms in a minute. The one area we do get uh, software and algorithm developers from time to time that, you know, the inventor, the creator thinks are um, unique or will improve a process somehow. It, I don't have a lot of, there's not a lot of comfort in the field in terms of patenting software these days. Um, you can copyright a particular iteration like when your code, when you write it down, that's copyrightable and your derivative from that is copyrightable. But oftentimes, you know, a lot of code is relying on the same, a lot of the same script. So it's hard to say what to do there. But the one thing you wanna be thinking about for this or anything that's a trade secret, and frankly, even when you're discussing something for which you own the copyright or uh, have rights to the patent is, thinking about this as a trade secret or something uh, proprietary. And so um, when you're in your negotiations with a potential licensor or you wanna reach out to them, there are some things you wanna, you wanna start with. And those can include the non-disclosure and confidentiality agreements where you say, look, I'm gonna, um, they can cover many things. First off is the, if you are talking about um, the nuts and bolts, if you will, of your algorithm or your software with somebody so they can see how it might apply, you obviously wanna make sure that they're contractually bound, which forms a legal right for you, not to take what you've shared with them or certainly take it and share it with, with anybody else. Right, so 
Another thing you want to do in this context, a lot of the times, if you're having negotiations about potential uh, business relations with someone, it kind of independent of the IP you're brainstorming that you might deploy with the other party, is just the fact that you're having those and you're, you're maybe starting to talk about pricing and fee structures and so on. So all of that stuff, to the extent you can, you want to get into a non-disclosure agreement so that you're protected if for some reason the other party breaches, even though you might not be protected under the patent or copyright law, you have legal rights for breach of contract at that, at that point. Um, and these are just some of the terms that I like to see. Non-disclosures and confidentiality clauses are very standard at this point. The one thing that you kind of want to see is the last one, which is if there is a potential for disclosure, you want the right to be able to get in the court immediately, not wait to be damaged and have the court stop the disclosure so that you can preserve those rights because once it's out in the public then you're just dealing with trying to sue for sue for damages um, so here's here's three more uh, points I would talk to anybody in doing business with anybody but particularly if you're in the business of acquiring or um, selling or licensing intellectual property <clears throat> excuse me first is the, it, I'm assuming you all know what indemnification is, but briefly, it just it's a contractual obligation or assumption of a contractual obligation to protect the other party if certain things happen. And it's negotiable what those other things are. So for example, is if I'm selling you a, uh, a, wor a novel that I wrote that you're gonna publish and put out in the market and sell. I'm gonna indemnify for you and promise you that I'm not, at least to the best of my knowledge, infringing on anybody else's copyright to somebody's earlier question. So the difference there is, well, do I give you a blanket indemnity to say, well, if, if it turns out I, I infringed, then I owe the publishing company for that? Or do I say, I can only tell you that it's to the best of my knowledge. And the difference is between your being the, the purchaser's insurer, which says no matter what, if somebody shows up with an infringement claim, me, the author, is going to step up and cover the cost related to that or, or obtain the rights versus saying, nah, it's only as far as I know. I'm just an author, I'm not an insurance company. So when, <clears throat> when you get to that, indemnification clause, you want to be careful about what rights you're, what obligations you're assuming and what rights you're giving to the other party. And of course, if you're acquiring the same is true. So if you're in the business of either selling or publishing somebody's or marketing and uh, commercializing someone's intellectual property, you want to be thinking about insurance coverage, which is typically more absolute and because there's a fee of associated with it. But, you know, insurance companies are good at, a, at identifying potential risk and assigning a, a premium to it, which will protect you. For example, if you have to indemnify your publisher, your insurance company can write you a policy that will say, we will step in and act in your place if, if the publisher receives a claim of infringement. So part of your business planning and cost planning should always include uh, cost of appropriate insurance. And the last thing on, on this point is uh, limitation of liability. If, if you do a job for somebody or you license them something or sell them a piece of work for a hundred dollars, you know, you do a little one hour gig for somebody, you don't want to take on $10,000 worth of liability. So the amount of risk that you take on as the seller of the intellectual property or the licensor of the intellectual property should roughly 
be in line with the, the amount that you're being compensated. And sometimes people will say it's going to be a multiple, that my liability won't exceed two times what I'm paid to do the work. So again, don't accept unlimited liability. I know this a little bit in the weeds, but these are important terms if you're, if you're in that, you know, in the business of commercializing your IP. So moving on to some other ones, these are less important. How are you going to resolve your dispute? Where are you going to resolve it? If you're licensing, uh, if you're licensing to a multinational and you have to bring any dispute you have in, in Los Angeles or God forbid overseas, and you're a small creator of, of content in, in Massachusetts, your rights to sue, you know, have gone way down just because commercially it's not going to be easy for you. So sometimes you'd like to agree to a mutually convenient forum. Sometimes you'd like to think about arbitrating or trying to mediate before arbitration because it's quicker and cheaper. So if you can get at least a, a neutral forum on dispute resolution and think about whether arbitration would be a better way to go if there's a dispute about the contract or about a potential breach for infringement or so on. Or the last one, which is uh, warranties. And again, this goes back to the indemnification. But a lot of times a, the acquirer of the content, or if you're the acquirer of the content, are going to want the creator or the person licensing it or selling it to warrant that they own it, that the, uh, there, is, there are no infringements or no infringements to their knowledge. So you want to be careful about those clauses and be careful that they don't carry independent penalties associated with them. I'm sorry, there's some kind of uh, leaf blower company out there, but that's all I have. If you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them now. Otherwise, I'll thank you for your time. I hope you found this useful and please take a minute to fill out the feedback form so we can make it better. So we can try a few more questions if you're okay with that. Oh yeah, I've got plenty of time. a lot of concepts and I think people, a lot of it's just um, clarifying the different types of um, protections uh -huh. available. Um, so Chris is asking, would the name of an online company need to be trademarked at the U.S. level? Not necessarily. Again, you own the trademark when you use it. You can attach the trademark um, if you think you want to protect it because it's unique to you and it's an important part of your branding and marketing. The first thing you'll want to do is go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. It's called the TESS database. And you can actually type in the term that you're using and see what pops up. And then when you see, you may see a big list or a small one. And then you can see when you click on a given trademark for a live trademark, you'll see what classification that's in. So if you're online delivering online educational products, it'll say, uh, you know, educational products online and, and uh, hard copy or something. So that's how you would, you would bore down on that. Okay, thank you. But, but it's not required. Um, Christy is asking, does IP get reflected on the balance sheet and how do you assign a value to it? That might be a better question for Eric. I know that a lot of companies assign enormous amounts of value to their patent portfolio, to the value of uh, certain copyrighted works, but I don't know if Eric is still there. Maybe he could weigh in on that. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as assigning value to a patent, you got, you know, two uh, areas to consider. One is uh, tax, for tax purposes, and um, basically, we don't give tax advice. So <laughs> my understanding is, though, on, for tax purposes, a patent is an, what they call an intangible. I think it's uh, recorded for tax purposes at whatever you pay, whatever your costs are to acquire them. And I think they're amortizable or, or written off over uh, 15 years, I believe. For, for uh, financial statement purposes in the world of GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, uh, I'm not sure if it's at, recorded also at cost, um, but uh, 
you know, fair value was up, could obviously be far more. But I don't have a, a clear answer really on that. And I would add that the IRS is another great resource for information. And I'm willing to bet you that there's an IRS circular about how they can think about uh, intellectual property. Yeah. Okay. Um, back again to that phrase on the t-shirt that somebody was asking, <laughs> the benefits of a trademark versus a copyright. Just to go over that again. Well, the, the copyright is usually more than the sentence. So you're, you're, they're not quite the same thing. The, the benefit of the trademark is that it's associated with your trade or service. So you're saying that I'm the person who can use this name to market and brand my, my uh, trade or service. Whereas a copyright, you're just saying I own the work, but it's not associated with uh, any particular uh, trade or service. Okay. Good or service. He's asking about artificial intelligence and how that fits into here. Artificial intelligence, I would think, is fundamentally software and algorithms, right? So it, it, that's where I would place it. I don't think that there's any uh, there's a lot of scholarly discussion, but there's no, um, I'm not aware of any changes in the law yet that talk about whether something could be advanced enough as AI that it could not be uh, protectable to the extent it would be protectable due to the underlying code or, or algorithms. You know, this is kind of in that area like um, companies were trying to patent certain, they found certain indigenous tribes, I think of some in South America that um, had certain resistances to diseases that were endemic down there, but were really tough to foreigners who would live down there. And companies were coming in and trying to get the blood and figuring out what it was and trying to patent that. And the kind of rural court, as best I could do, the world patent authorities basically said, no, you can't do that. So I think I, I would base it in the thinking about the software code and the, and the algorithms for now. Okay. Um, That's a great question. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of comments th thanking you for your, um, for, for all the information you provided. Um, oh, welcome. Somebody has a painting without a signature that can, is there any way to find out if it was protected somehow? <laughs> well, if, somebody owns it the person who painted it owned the copyright now the copyright depending on when it was created may have expired or the person may have intended for it to be used in the public domain right i mean there's people that that do that certainly this sounds a little bit like antiques roadshow now but you know yeah. my guess is that uh if you don't see anything on there and sometimes signatures can be kind of artfully buried in the, in the work in various places. But if you don't see anything on there and you wanted to use that image, you could certainly use the image. Uh, the question would be, could you claim the copyright to supersede whoever the author was? And you could certainly say, this is my copyrighted image. And if somebody said, no, my grandfather painted that, you'd have to back off. But you certainly, there's nothing on that painting that would tell you that you can't at least use the image. Okay. Um, Scott's asking if there are multiple authors on a song with different percent of ownership, does one person file and list the other authors? If they're joint authors on one piece of music? Right. Well, every, if you don't have a joint author agreement, every one of them owns it individually. They can go sell it where they want. They're all, each joint author is accountable to the others to share any profits from their commercializing activity. So if, if songwriter A sells it, uh, they don't get to keep all the profits, but they don't have to get any permission from songwriter B to sell it or to license it, but they do have to split the profits. Great, thank you.
Mm -hmm. I think we can um, maybe stop the questions there. I appreciate everybody participating in this in this webinar. You'll be um, you'll, you'll receive a link tomorrow for the recording of it. And if you have questions that didn't get answered, please feel free to, to contact SCORE, and we'll um, and Bill or somebody else can try to get you taken care of. So um, thank you for your help and goodbye. Bill, yep. goodbye, have one more thing, Bill. Oh. If, if people want to get a hold of you, what should they do? Oh, yes. <laughs> I realized I didn't put this on here. I'll give you my SCORE email, and you can always find me on the SCORE Boston website under my name, Halsey, H-U-L-S-E-Y. But the, my SCORE email is William.Halsey, H-U-L-S-E-Y, at scorevolunteer.org. Thanks, Eric, for reminding me. I just put it in the chat for everybody. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. But uh, again, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, yeah. uh, folks, for attending. And uh, everybody stay safe. We're going to close the yeah. meeting. Thanks again. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.